And good evening and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am Renee Battle Brooks, the Executive Director of the Prince George's County Human Relations Commission, the county's civil and human rights education and enforcement agency. We are delighted to partner with the library for tonight's program on Black voter engagement. Tonight's event is part of an ongoing series called Voting, Democracy in Action. Since last summer, the HRC and the library have hosted programs that explore different issues related to electoral engagement, ranging from the nuts and bolts of how to vote in a pandemic to how Martin Luther King Jr. His legacy influences contemporary efforts to end voter suppression. The 2021 Voting Democracy in Action series is supported in part by Maryland Humanities through the Voices and Votes Electoral Engagement Project, which is made possible by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation's Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative. I am very honored to introduce tonight's special guest, who we are proud to call a neighbor and is a Prince Georgian, Leonard Pitts Jr. In a career that spans 43 years, Leonard has worked as a columnist, a college professor, a radio producer, and a lecturer. But those are just the job titles. If you ask him what he does, what he is, he'll tell you now what he would have told you then. He is a writer. Millions of people are glad he is. They read him every week in one of the most popular newspaper columns of the country. Many more have come to know him through a series of critically acclaimed books, including his latest, a novel of race, faith, and World War II called The Last Thing You Surrender. Pitt's stubborn devotion to the art and craft of words has yielded many awards, chief among them the 2004 Pulitzer Prize for Commentary. He is in demand as a lecturer across the country and has taught at a number of institutions of higher learning, including Hampton University, Ohio University, the University of Maryland, and Virginia Commonwealth University. Leonard was born and raised in Southern California. He was awarded a degree in English from the University of Southern California at the age of 19, having entered school at 15 on a special honors program. Since 1995, he and his wife have lived in Bowie, Maryland. So we're thrilled to have him here tonight. We're also thrilled to have our moderator, Michelle Hamill. She is the library's chief operating officer for public services. Now, Michelle is renowned nationally for her leadership in advancing social justice and equity in libraries, not to mention being a fabulous colleague and the co-host of our monthly Elephant We Don't See Diversity Dialogue series. She is an adjunct lecturer for the University of Maryland's College of Information Studies, served as co-interim CEO of the library, and previously worked at Baltimore County Public Library and as a storyteller. So we are thrilled about tonight's program. Again, we are so glad that everyone has joined us. And so without further ado, we're going to listen. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Pitts. I am so delighted to be having this to have this opportunity to speak with you tonight. Thank you. I am so excited, such a prolific writer. I am so honored to be doing this. And I, I feel like I'm like a fan or I feel kind of <laughs> giddy. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll take that. Thank you. So why don't we jump right in? Okay. Uh, tonight we're discussing voter suppression. And, um, you know, given some of the recent um, activities uh, in politics and certainly what went on in with the elections in Georgia and the recount, can you tell uh, our listeners tonight what is voter suppression and how and why? And, and I, I hope I'm saying this as politically correct as I can. If African Americans are seemingly, by some, the least powerful people, why are we the targets of voter suppression? 
Well, first, because we're not the least powerful people, <laughs> but but if they can get us to if people people can get us to believe that, you know, score one for for that side. Uh, voter suppression, you know, to take the first part of your question first, a uh, voter suppression is is uh, the act of find as it sounds, the act of finding ways to uh, to tamp down the vote of a particular demographic group, uh, African Americans being the most frequent target. Uh, historically, uh, this has been done through various uh, legal means. Obviously, once upon a time, they did it by simply passing laws that say black people can't vote. Uh, and when uh, the courts began to frown on that, they came up with uh, remedies that were supposedly race neutral and that they didn't mention race, but they were clearly targeted toward African Americans. For instance, the most famous one is probably the grandfather clause, which stated that you can't vote if your grandfather didn't vote. And this is, we're talking, I guess, the late uh, 19th, early 20th centuries. Well, in, in the late 19th, early 20th century, my grandfather would have been a slave. So this means I'm permanently disenfranchised. So, you know, th these were the methods that, that, that were in place. Uh, obviously, by the 1960s, they had the poll taxes and they had the, um, the literacy exams, all sorts of uh, means and measures designed to suppress the vote. And the sad thing and what, what makes a really troubling statement about this country is that it is still going on. We had a Voting Rights Act that was passed in 1965, uh, and you know was was designed to remedy this. And then we had the uh, the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, which I believe was in 2012 by the Supreme Court, under the logic uh, that uh, because things had changed, because it had worked essentially, uh, there was no longer any need for uh, for the preclearance provision of the act, which required states with a history or communities with a history of voter suppression to get permission from the Justice Department before changing their voting laws. And uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said correctly that this was sort of like uh, throwing away your umbrella in a storm because you're no longer getting wet. And uh, we are now getting wet because since 2012, uh, we're seeing the rise of all sorts of scams and schemes designed to uh, to to keep African Americans from voting. That, if you're black, you're likely to have to wait longer to vote. Uh, you're, you're in Georgia in particular, you you uh, you have to face this issue of these um, this law which says that if your if your name is misspelled by even so much as an additional comma, <laughs> that they can purge you from the rolls. You got voter purges in uh, in Ohio and on and on and on. And this gets to the fact that we are not uh, powerless. This gets to the fact that we are a large uh, a, a large voting block. And rather than take the steps to appeal to that voting block. Uh, the you know, and I'm I'm not going to be politically correct, so forgive forgive me. <laughs> the, rather than take the steps to appeal that voting block, the Republican Party has decided to do what it can to neutralize that voting block. That's why you're seeing the photo ID laws and the laws passed in in North Carolina with the, what the court calls surgical precision to keep African Americans from voting because they fear, you know, there's there's a great fear of what would happen if African Americans, you know, were ever to exercise their power, as we saw in the last election, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm going to quote your article um, in the Miami Herald where you said um, the decision um, to eliminate that pre-clearance was mm. asinine. And oh. I told you, I don't do, I'm not very, I don't do politically correct. I try to be politically honest. Yeah. And um, what have you seen in some of the states uh, aside from the things that you mentioned with requiring ID or um, the, the uh, your name spelled wrong, what else have you seen that I think people could, um, because, that, well, one of the things is that as the individual who's mm -hmm. been suppressed, you have to prove right. that um, there was, that you were the one who was suppressed. However, um, I'm sure there are some things going on that you may not as an individual really see as voter suppression. So so what are some of those things that you oh, will need to fight against? We're seeing polling places closed down uh, in Dodge City, uh, which is city, Nebraska, I believe it is. Um, I may have I may have mis moved it a state or two. But in Dodge City, uh, where they it's apparently a large uh, black and brown and I guess native population, they moved, I think, believe, what I believe was the only polling place. They moved it out of town. Basically, they they are banking on the fact that that people of color are less likely to have reliable transportation, so these places are harder to get to. And then we, you know, we we see just outright scams where they uh, they target uh, African American voters uh, with robocalls uh, 
saying that, uh, you know, with misinformation, misidentifying the election day or saying uh, so and so has already been elected. So you don't have to get out. You don't have to go out and vote all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it, it's, it's getting more and more naked. It used to have a fig leaf of saying, well, no, we're not trying to suppress you, but we just want to protect the integrity of the vote. We're, we're just concerned with voter fraud, which as a functional matter does not exist in this country. There's, there's no level of voter fraud that has come close to, to changing any election. So that's, 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 a, that's a fig leaf. But now they're not even, now in, essence, in essence, they're not even using the fig leaf. One, um, one lawmaker, and I forget who this was, but this was just a few days ago, said that voting is not a right, it's a privilege. And that goes to the foundation of everything that we're supposed to be as a, as a nation, one person, one vote. That's what I was always taught. And suddenly, you know, we're, we're hearing this rhetoric uh, that basically belongs to the pre-Constitution days when uh, they said that uh, only men with land, that, that was the argument, men, you know, men with, uh, with land or with, with a certain income or whatever could vote. We're hearing people actually um, defend, uh, you know, essentially that kind of thinking. It, it, these are scary times. I think the reason that the times are scary is because, to get back to what you said, we're not powerless. People see a rising tide of people of color, uh, demanding equity, demanding their fair share of this American dream and this American pie. And rather than figure out ways to manage this change so that we all come out ahead, so that we all prosper and profit, uh, the the goal and the aim has been, let me see what we can do to tamp this down. And so, you know, that that that's what they're doing. They're using every every they're using the law every which way they can to uh, to, to 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 do this. And it's it is really it's a crying shame 56 years after the Voting Rights Act that we even have to have this discussion. It's just, it's just amazing yeah. and, and really sad that some people are so determined to, to pull us back to, to the bad old days. Mm-hmm. So, so what can people do when, uh, let, let's take a state like Maryland where mm-hmm. we believe that, um, you know, we aren't faced with some of the things that further south right. are faced with. So what can we do in Maryland if we come up against some of these things like polling places closing or those robocalls? Um, how do we fight against? I think that we, I think voters in, in Maryland, uh, and again, it's less dire here than say it is in Georgia, but I really believe that what affects one affects all uh, at some point. So I believe that we uh, just like voters in Georgia, Mississippi, or wherever, need to learn to be very vigilant about uh, about protecting our votes. We need to um, we need to be active in voting in every every election. And I I plead guilty. There's some small and off year elections. I ah, who cares who wins, you know. And mm-hmm. the last few years have taught me no, we can't do that. You know, so there, there, there's a need to be vigilant and vote in every election. There's a need to make sure that you vet your sources of information. Don't let just anybody tell you what's going on. And this, I know this sounds like tooting my own horn because I work for a newspaper. But yeah, look for a traditional, reliable news source to get your information. Facebook is not a news source. When I every time I hear people giving me information that they got, oh, where'd you hear that? I got it off of Facebook. That's not news. That's something somebody pasted there and it's being passed down the chain. And people who are unsophisticated in their news consumption are are taking it as fact. And we saw uh, a month ago at the Capitol, the extreme ends of what happens when you don't ground yourself in fact. Mm-hmm. You know, the, 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 you, we cannot. And, and that's that's the future of this country. That's the future of this country until or unless we decide that facts matter and that facts in relation to our voting and, uh, and, to, our, and to our elections matter. Until or unless we do that, you know, we're, what we're looking at, you know, down, downtown could be, could be all of us. Because if you don't know, yeah. here's the thing. Um, and I've been saying this for a while. It used to be that the great divide, the great divides were, were black and white or the great divide was um, money and, and, and not having money. And those things are still very important, don't get me wrong. But I believe that the, that the divide now and in the future, the, uh, another important divide, which isn't really talked about, is having knowledge and not having knowledge, knowing and not That's knowing, true. having information and not having information. And if you mm-hmm. don't have the information or if you're willing to, you know, to just accept whatever comes in over the transom because somebody, somebody somewhere told you this, 
you know, then you're going to find yourself always at a disadvantage. That's in voting. That's in, 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 in everything. Uh, right. So, you know, that that I think is critical. Know where you're getting your information from and make sure it's a, an inf a source that you trust. And a shameless plug here, always check your local library, because if nothing else, we can fact check it, check it for you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. See, the, the sad thing is a lot of people say they want the fact, but they don't. What people, a lot of people think they want the fact, but what they actually want is to be confirmed in what they already believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, you've got to develop the, the, the intellectual rigor and the toughness of mind to say, no, I want to know what's true, even if it contradicts what I'd like That's to right. believe. That's right. You know, and, and that is not easy. That's not easy for anybody of any political stripe. You know, I, um, I, I did a um, column some years back on the Washington football team and, and their former name, which I found offensive. I mm -hmm. find offensive and, and thought that, and forgive me, forgive me, greater Washington, D.C. area. I know I speak heresy unto you, um, but which I found offensive. And uh, I expected, you know, Native Americans should find it offensive, too. And the Washington Post did a story. They did a poll of Native Americans and found that most Native Americans did not find it offensive. Mm. And I remember my first instinct was, well, there must be something wrong with the poll. Because I didn't want to, I didn't want to mm -hmm. question my thinking. Right. This was a fact that was at odds with what I'd chosen to believe. And see, this is the rig. And then you know, and then I caught myself and said, "No, well, maybe there is something wrong with the poll, but you don't know. You don't know that th that there is. And as far as as far as you know, you know, that's the truth. So you've got to readjust. You know, your thinking. That's mm -hmm. what we have to do with regard to um, to to this political moment that we find ourselves in. Know that you know what you know. That's right. That's right. We did get a question and it says, would you comment on felony conviction voting suppression? Well, there you go. That's another <laughs> that that uh, I'm, I'm sad. I'm sorry that I missed that one because that I missed mentioning that one because that's one of the big ones. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's it's really one of the um, most convoluted aspects of this of this whole thing, because what you've got is a, is a system that works overtime to saddle uh, black and brown people with criminal records, <laughs> you know, and we've mm -hmm. seen all the statistics. There was a study that came out some years back that said a, an African-American and a white uh, drug uh, offender, a first time drug offender with the same criminal records. The white guy was 45 times, I believe it was more likely to escape incarceration than, than the black one. This is, right. and, this is, and this is when you account for uh, or, or adjust for different incomes and ability, access to lawyers, all that stuff they're still 45 times more likely. And it's, there's all these statistics which show that the, the, uh, the, the, the prison pipeline is working to funnel us into, into, uh, into the gray bar hotels around this country. And then now that they've done that and, and prison becomes largely a black and brown experience, then we say, well, black and brown, then we say felons, no, nope, not black and brown, felons can't vote. Right, right. And we do this in a country where felons has largely come to mean in, in, for as a practical matter, African-American people. And, mm -hmm. you know, and th there's some deviousness there. That's there's right. A, there's some there's some Machiavellian deviousness <laughs> to that, <laughs> that really, that really blows my mind. Why is it? And here's the thing. If you're a felon and you've done, you've done your time, you've paid your debt to society, as we used to say, mm -hmm. when you get out, you are not exempted from the responsibility to pay taxes. So if you're not exempted mm -hmm. from your responsibilities as a citizen, why should you be denied your rights as a citizen? That's right. You know, if you don't want, if you don't, I can understand that if you say, well, you're a felon, we don't want your money. Mm -hmm. you know? But what they say is you're a felon, we don't want you to have a vote, uh, have a voice. And th right. again, they there's a pretense that this is about some high principle. This is not about principle. This is about very soon, I believe it's uh, 20 years now, the Census Bureau says, that this is not going to be a majority white country. It's going to be a country where nobody has a majority. Yeah, you know, everybody's going to be a country mm -hmm. where, where we're going to have new, basically numerical parity. And that scares the heck out of some folk. Yes, it does. And so, yes, and does. so the name of the game is how can we neuter this vote? How can we neuter this political power? You know, it's, 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 it's a different version, but it's, it's essentially what South Africa lived under for so many years. Whenever there were 5 million black African and 25 million white ones. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I have that exactly wrong. 5 million white, Af uh, white Africans and 25 million black Africans and the blacks lived under sub in, in subjugation. 
because mm-hmm. the power was held in, in probably one fifth of, of the of the society. I, they, I'm not saying that they're trying to impose apartheid, apartheid, but what they are trying to do is to create a situation where a minority, a small group, still holds power over everybody else. That, that mm-hmm. is very much the name of the game here. Yes. So with that being said, how does voter suppression and systemic racism connect directly to the attempted coup on January 6th and the current political crisis in America? Oh, my Lord, this is only an hour long. <laughs> <laughs> this is only an hour long. Um, the attempted coup was the ultimate expression of, first of all, the, the misinformation campaign that I spoke about uh, earlier, this whole idea that, you know, people will people believe garbage uh, because it came to them from some faceless, nameless, whomever online. But again, this also reflects the, um, the, the, the most extreme form of the panic that is now gripping some, and I emphasize some, of our white fellow Americans at the idea of sharing power in this country. You know, we, we, we keep being told that, um, although we hear it less now, thankfully, but we used to keep, we used to always hear that, you know, Donald Trump had tapped into economic anxiety. Mm-hmm. And two things about that. One, the statistics show that uh, people who were economically stressed were actually slightly more likely to vote for Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump. Uh, but um, the other thing is, if it's economic anxiety, who has more economic anxiety than African Americans? Right. If it's economic anxiety, black folks and brown folks should have been should have been, you know, number one. This was never mm-hmm. about economic anxiety. It has always been about this sense of threat, this sense of I've been. I've been the majority and, I, and now I'm not. The, the analogy that I use all the time with people is if for 400 years you have been Gladys Knight and one day somebody tells you now you're just a pip, okay? <laughs> you, you used to sing lead. Right. Now, you, now you're just in the background making harmony with the rest of us pips. Mm-hmm. That's hard. That's, that's right. Hard. And that's, you know, and that's what, 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 what they're rebelling against. So, that, you know, this whole thing of smashing windows and uh, in, in, in tearing into the Capitol just shows the utter hypocrisy and the, the emptiness of the rhetoric of these folks. These are the same folks, mind you, who, when Black Lives Matter was protesting, kept telling us that Blue Lives Matter. And they mm-hmm. killed a cop. That's right. They killed a cop and they injured. I didn't realize how bad the injuries were in some of the other police officers. They killed mm-hmm. a cop and they injured over 100. Some of them, very one will, will lose his sight. Others yeah. have spinal cord damage, all this just terrible damage mm-hmm. from the Blue Lives Matter crowd. Yeah, yeah. So, it, so, so you got to learn to look below the rhetoric. Every time you take the rhetoric at face value, you find out there is no there there. It's not about Blue Lives Matter. It's not about economic anxiety. It's not about let's follow the Constitution. Because following the Constitution, you never would have been breaking, breaking windows of the Capitol. It's That's not right. about any of that. It's about... I'm nervous about what's going to happen, you know, to, to people like me 20 years from now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So let's let's move to something a little bit more exciting, what I consider exciting. OK, let's talk about Stacey Abrams and what she did in Georgia to get Raphael Warnock, uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff to the U.S. Senate. Um, and let me just say that at the time when uh, they were storming the Capitol, mm-hmm. we had an African and African American and a Jewish man <laughs> <laughs> from Georgia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> making the Senate. So see, see that's um, the hope. For, for, mm-hmm. for some folks, that's the fear. For the rest of us, that's the hope. The thing that mm-hmm. that that some of us fail to really truly appreciate especially people in news media, is that the people who are not like those storming the, 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 the Capitol, the people who are not like those who supported our former president, mm-hmm. are the majority. They mm-hmm. are the absolute majority. It is not accidental that only once since 1993 has the Republican Party managed uh, to win the popular vote in a presidential election. One time. Right. OK, this is not accidental. The rest of us are the majority. Mm-hmm. Donald Trump uh, won, uh, was it uh, uh, 74 million 
votes this last time out, more more than any sitting president has ever won. And he got swamped. Mm-hmm. Still. So, mm-hmm. so when we when the rest of us turn out, when the rest of us use our power, then we can do or have whatever it is that we want to do. We can elect whomever we want. We can do whatever it is that, that, that we feel needs to be done because the power resides here with, with, with African-American voters, uh, voters of color, and, and a lot of white voters who are disenchanted and, and, and disgusted by what they see. That's the majority in this country. But we mm-hmm. have allowed ourselves to be bamboozled into believing, uh, into believing too strongly in our own incompetence and irrelevance, and we don't show up. See, voters, the voters who show up, those who, who, who support Mr. Trump and all the rest of that stuff, they, they show up because they're motivated out of fear. If I don't vote, somebody's going to take something away from my daughter's going to have to, it's going to get gay married, or, you know, I'm going to have a black person doing this, or there's going to be, I'm going to have to say habla espanol, something, you know, they're going to take something from me. So there's this right. constant fear and fear is a great motivator. Mm-hmm. Fear is a great motivator. The rest of us need to find our own motivator. It can't be fear because fear makes you, fear also makes you stupid. You right. know, so it can't, right. it can't be fear, but we need to, we need to find a way to be as motivated for for change as some folks are motivated by fear of change. Does that make sense? It does. It yeah. really does. But so what I'm wondering is what do what what do we need to look toward to remain motivated? Because so you know what happens a lot of times we get excited, we got yep. somebody in office that yep. we wanted to have an office yep. and then the next election we don't turn out the way yep. we need to turn out and someone else gets in there. So what do we do to remain motivated to sustain what happened in Georgia throughout this country? That is the sixty-four thousand dollar question. I'm looking to to Stacey Abrams and hoping that uh, that she and not just her but others like her, what mm-hmm. they did in Georgia and what in, in, in what they're trying to do elsewhere that it become that it's not just a phenomenon, not just a one shot, but that they create standing organizations designed to and aim to turn out the vote. I think that is absolutely critical. And again, mm-hmm. it, it comes down to answering this question, and I, I'm not sure that I have the answer for it, but it comes down to finding the answer for the question of of how do you motivate people to vote be, for something beyond fear? How do you move them beyond just fear? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and 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 that's you know when when we when you figure that out, then then you, you'll be in you'll be in great shape. When you fit when we figure that out, we'll be in fine in fine shape. We've had fear for thirty years, mm-hmm. at least. You know, mm-hmm. Willie, Hort- Willie Horton's coming to get you. You know, your, mm-hmm. your, your child's going to be gay married. Uh, you know, the le- you know lesbians are coming. Oh, the Muslims. Forgot the Muslims. Let's not forget the Muslims are coming. Right. The caravan is coming. Somebody's always coming to get you. Mm-hmm. Somebody's all- and, and that has worked, you know, like a charm to to get a minority party and a minority and, and minority interest. I mean, minority, not racially, but just in terms of numbers to get the smaller party with the with the, the smaller group of voters, uh, you know, into power. And yeah. we, you know, those of us who represent the majority need to lead, need to learn to act like the majority, and maybe start bigfooting it a little bit. That's right. You know? Yeah. The so the um, if uh, your previous president um, is not impeached, he can mm. run again. Mm. He's talked about uh, starting his own political party. Mm. And uh, what can voters do now? to um, help prevent that from happening? Well, not the impeachment, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, is there anything? I don't know if there's anything that can prevent him from running again. Uh, I think that uh, it would be very interesting in, uh, because, you know, it would <laughs> it, it would bring the fear factor to, the, to, to our side. <laughs> okay? mm-hmm. Because right. <laughs> I, think, I think it might be a great motivator. <laughs> you know, look at it in that regard. It would bring the fear factor to our side. Oh Lord, we went through that before. We never want to go through that again. You might mm-hmm. have record numbers. You know, you might. He, it, it, if if he ran, it might do more for the for the Democratic Party than 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 for the Republican Party. Yeah. Uh, you know that that's entirely a possibility. But again, I think we have to get out of this idea. We can't have this idea of always having to be having to be motivated to do our civic duty, having to be right. you know kept in fear to do our civic duty, you know, wanting better schools, wanting better funded libraries, wanted, mm-hmm. wanting safer streets, wanting, uh, you know, uh, to, to uh, 
uh, er, eradicate the food deserts, you know, mm -hmm. all of mm -hmm. this stuff, you know, wanting better policing, wanting black lives to matter, all of this should be enough to get us uh, to the polls and to get our friends and neighbors to the polls. We have to learn to think, we have to learn to think about this strategically. Um, yes. The New York Times did a piece uh, shortly after the um, Voting Rights Act was gutted, uh, talking about, and I hadn't realized this, the long campaign that uh, preceded uh, this, this gutting of the Voting Rights Act. Apparently this had been going on for years you know, in lawsuits and, and things of that nature, uh, culminating in, in uh, Shelby v. v. Holder, which got the Voting Rights Act. Well, I didn't know this. And it made me wonder, OK, for those of us who who believed in the voting, who believe in the Voting Rights Act and who, you know, uh, support it and, and who owe a lot of their their their, you know, whatever they've achieved in life to the Voting Rights Act. Where were we? Right. 30 years. We, we sort of, you know, we sort of look, OK, that was 1965. Thank you, John Lewis. Appreciate you. Yeah, right. Thanks, Lyndon Johnson. We appreciate you. We're we gone now. We good. Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying, oh, no, we got to defend this. You right. Know, what is what is the quote? I think it's a Jefferson quote. Um, uh, the, the, the price of li uh, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. I think that's, that's Thomas Jefferson. I may be wrong. But eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. We have been guilty of not having eternal vigilance. Mm -hmm. And we have, and, and as a result, we have seen, you know, we, we see this huge gain, one of the crown jewels of the civil rights years, just taken away. I never mm -hmm. thought that the Voting Rights Act could go away. I figured, okay, you know, done that. You know, we got right. that. That's, 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 but, but the victory is never completely won. And we need to get mm -hmm. into that mindset. So what can we do to... Um not have it be just an act that somebody gets to bring up in Congress and the Senate to as for a vote every so often. Because I, I think it's been uh, revised, what, yeah. I think four times? Had to be reauthorized. As, um, yeah, so, every, so. Whatever years. And so I, I know of at least four times that they've done something. Yeah. yeah. So what can we do? Is there anything that we can do? Yeah, why we can martial, our, martial our political party, power rather, uh, mm -hmm. Vote in, uh, identify and vote in the people who think as we do and who understand and who identify this as an important thing, and then use our numerical advantage to send them to Congress and, if necessary, to the White House. You know, it, 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 it's we the, it's the same game that has been played by the other side. But just again, we haven't you know we haven't been as energetic about it. But that that's essentially what what has to happen. Let's use our political clout to find people who identify this as something that's that's important. Something that has to be done. I think the the what we're hoping to, will be called the John Lewis Voting Rights Act mm -hmm. is of critical importance. If the Democrats are smart, they will recognize it as not just important for the country, but important for them as a party, because mm -hmm. it's their it's their voters who are mostly being disenfranchised. So, yeah. so I so find people who will who will who will stand up for this, put them in office, and if mm -hmm. they if they if they show that they've got jello in their spines, and you know, get rid of them and get somebody else, you know, mm -hmm. the, it's the same game has been that has been that has been played on us. We need to take that take the playbook and and use it in reverse. Um, the point the um, so what you know, I think about when. Um, President Obama was in office mm -hmm. and he had both the House and the Senate mm -hmm. and the implicit and bias that by, in, implicit biases that existed. He couldn't get much passed when he right. had both the House and the Senate. So it says that a lot of our leaders, even the Democratic leaders, still race is um, an overwhelming factor for them. And um, so this that's why I guess it. We, we have not moved to um, make this anything other than an act. Yeah. Um, how do we find out? How do voters find out which one, which of the congressmen would be willing to push that effort? Well, I mean, you go and meet them at their, at their you know, you, 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 you meet them at their, at their events prior to them even being congresspersons. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you go out and hear them and hear them talk. And, and frankly, maybe even you get involved with the um, with the effort to identify the people and push forward who you want, who in your community is 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 smart and articulate and 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 is in the right place on this particular issue, and then you 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 push that person through the political machinery. In other words, instead of instead of vetting someone who is chosen for you, choose someone. 
Mm-hmm. You know, who who is that person? I mean, because all of them come from from somewhere. And if you right. look, particularly at, at these these last few years in, in in Congress, we've seen all sorts of unlikely people rise. Mm-hmm. Um, Ocasio Cortez was a bartender what two three years ago, right. and that and that's used that that's often used as an insult against her. But mm-hmm. if you look at it, it really isn't. It's the greatest statement of what America is supposed to be that you could find that this woman could be a could be tending bar three years ago. And with her smarts and determination and with all these people behind her rise to, to the United States Congress, you know, a few years later. Wow. So, right. you know, why not? Why not a librarian? That's right. <laughs> why, why not a sanitation <laughs> worker? Why not whomever who has, mm-hmm. that, who has that savvy and who has that who has that ability and who has that interest? Why That's not? right. And, and what I hear you saying is that this process doesn't just start at the polls. This right. process starts when you start to vet those candidates yeah. or when you even you may have a friend that you want to talk to to um, convince that friend to run. Um, so, you know, I think the, the message has to be let's not wait until the polls open to decide who we want to put in office. And you can make appointments with. Um, congressmen and senators and, and well, I don't know what they're going to do after <laughs> this recent <laughs> uprising, but yeah. um, that, that you can have conversations. These are everyday folks and not only should we um, have those conversations, but we should expect to have those conversations yeah. and it's important to, for our future and for the future of those who come after us. Yeah, um, and we and have come- a question. And come, come representing votes. Come, you know, I, I represent not just myself, but I represent X people from Prince George's County. I, I represent X, you know, demographic. You know, these mm-hmm. are the people who are behind me and we want to know what you're going to do about whatever the issue is that is, of, that is of importance to us. That's the way the thing is supposed to, is supposed to work. Right. But I think, you know, we've been lulled into believing in our own um, in- inability to get anything done. Mm-hmm. You know, you hear people saying, oh, so you see people say all the time, there's no difference between the parties. And I look at them like, are, right. are you kidding me? Right. You know, but 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 people sort of wear the shell of cynicism uh, to protect themselves from the danger of having to believe in change. Because mm-hmm. having to believe, believing in change is a dangerous thing. Wanting change, fighting for change can break your heart mm-hmm. because sometimes it's not going to happen. Right. So people right. protect themselves from that with this with this sort of shell of cynicism, but the shell of cynicism is not is not helpful either because what it essentially means is that you stand there and do nothing, except smirk in cynicism as things that you want done or not done and things that you have, including your vote, are taken away from you. Mm-hmm. So you mm-hmm. know, the being you know, I understand the, the 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 instinct to be cynical, but cynicism is not doing us any good. It's not helpful. No. So we have a question. Would you comment upon what, if any, responsibility the vocal national religious leaders have on voting suppression? (laughs) It's funny you should say that because I just a few hours ago finished my next column and it's on a documentary called The Black Church. And one of the things that it deals with is the fact that um, in the African-American church, as opposed to the white church, the white church is more about, and these are broad generalizations I recognize, but the white church is more about, um, you know, what's going to happen in the sweet by and by. And the black church is generally, the black church is not unconcerned with that, but the black church also is concerned with what's happening in the heart here and now. So I think that um, there is a, there is a crying need for leadership from all our churches. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whenever we, when, you know, um, William Barber, Reverend William Barber said in the documentary, that God is a God of the oppressed and that, and that any religion that is not talking about the oppressed, and I'd say any church that's not talking about the oppressed, isn't much of a religion or a church. So I think that there's that, you know, if you want to see what the faith, what if you want to talk about the faith community is doing, you should either be in a church that is working on these issues or push mm-hmm. your church toward working on, the, on these issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, this whole idea that church is not political, I don't know where that came from, it is, it is ahistorical and it's certainly never been the case in the African-American community. Certainly Not never been the case. People forget that Martin Luther King's title was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. That's right. You know? That's right. So th- this whole idea of the church as sort of an apolitical uh, uh, force is, is, has, never been, has never been true. So mm-hmm. there's, there's a need 
there is a need for moral courage and moral leadership starting, you know, with with the church. And I, I see some of it. I, you know, I, 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 I know, you know, pastors, uh, including my own, who are out there on the front lines and doing this. My, my pastor sent around a video of him being arrested at the uh, Capitol at a demonstration two, three years ago. And I was, I was, I was so proud of him. Yeah. I was going to say, did you cheer no, for no, him? No, not, not a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not a month ago. That ain't that ain't my past. Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, but two or three years ago, uh, some sort of demonstration, I forget what the demonstration was, but they were out there demonstrating and, and, and you know, and they got arrested and I was very proud of them. That's my past mm -hmm. in handcuffs. You mm -hmm. know. Uh, mm -hmm. and I yeah, I I I I wouldn't mind seeing more pastors and more parishioners in hand in handcuffs for the mm -hmm. obviously for the right cause. That's yeah. right. Obviously for the right cause, but I wouldn't I wouldn't mind seeing more of that. I think that there's a that there's a need for more of that. Mm -hmm. Um well, again, to quote William Barber, uh, talking about his Moral Mondays movement uh, in the documentary, one of the things he said that caught my attention was that uh, when he started leading the Moral Mondays demonstrations at the uh, North Carolina State House and people were getting arrested, he said they told he said many people told him I had lost my faith until this, mm. until they went down, until they found themselves at the State House on Mondays demonstrating uh, against anti-human uh, measures, uh, anti-equality measures that were that were you know uh, being passed or being contemplated in in uh, in North Carolina, that they said is what restored them to faith. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think that the, I think that's a very uh, powerful statement. To me, faith is not you know is faith something that you sit quietly and hold in your heart, or is faith something that compels no. you to go out and do something, including vote? Is faith mm -hmm. something that compels you to take to 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 take action? Faith, mm -hmm. faith without works is dead. It's dead. Yeah. And we need to be radical yeah. without faith. Yeah, as, as Dr. King was. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm looking to see if we have any other questions. Um, but I have, in a recent column, you challenged President Biden's call for unity as not <laughs> being the answer mm -hmm. for the moment we are facing as a country. Mm -hmm. You stated this moment then is a wake-up call. Democracy is fragile, and we've come closer to losing it than any generation since Lincoln's. We all should want to answer Biden's call to save it, but we all should also understand that it cannot be and it will not be saved at the expense of those who have too often and for far too long been shut out of America's lofty ideals. We too sing America. Let the GOP learn to accept this. Then unity will take care of itself. From a tactical perspective, what mm -hmm. do those who want America to be better for all need to do to make an impact when it seems like voting isn't enough? That's a that's that's a that's a lot. Then do you have <laughs> um <laughs> I I, 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 never, I, don't think I, ever, I don't think I ever feel that voting is not enough if 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 you if you vote strategically and vote uh, persistently. I don't think I ever feel that voting is not enough. I do believe that change doesn't come instantaneously, and that sometimes you don't get you know the result that you wanted. But I think that voting, and particularly in a democracy, not voting is not is is uh, surrendering your power and your voice. So I, I never believe that not that not voting is enough. But in terms of of tactically, uh, and and that particular column what i was talking about was this whole idea that you know we've just had this insurrection we've just had the capital breach for the first time since 18 was it 14 i believe it was mm -hmm. uh and now we're supposed to just move on and everything is, is hunky dory and that that's not realistic uh, I, I will fine tune that a little bit i will say that i don't necessarily believe in in unity at this moment but i'm glad that George, that joe biden does Okay. If that makes any sense, I think a president mm -hmm. is supposed to pull us. A he's little supposed further. to have hope. Yeah, he's supposed to have hope. He's supposed to pull us a little further than 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 maybe we think we can go. And you know, Lord knows, after four years of a president, you know, appealing to our worst, I'm not I'm not mad at a president who's trying to appeal to our best. But I think that at, at a, as a practical matter, the whole idea of unity, at least as it's being broached now, is this is is this whole thing of both sidesism. You know, mm -hmm. both sides mm -hmm. need to come together. Well, no, both sides didn't go crazy. You know, <laughs> seriously, that's like that's like 
<laughs> yeah. That's like if 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 your if your husband's beat, been beating you, you know, and and you leave him, and somebody says, "Well, y'all need to come together." No, he needs to stop hitting me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, he needs to stop hitting me, and he needs to get his act together. Then we can talk about you know maybe repairing this thing. You know, so that I, I, I really, the, the, my problem with the whole unity conversation is that it seems to proceed from the idea that both sides, quote unquote, are equally at fault here. And there is no objective way that anybody can, can, can believe that. Both sides are not equally at fault here. Both sides were not out there storming the United States Capitol. You know, and, right. and it and it's amazing how disingenuous some of the, um, some of uh, the supporters of this have been. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at a lot of the um, the impeachment hearing, but I understand that that uh, some of uh, Mr. Trump's defenders have brought forth Maxine Waters as sort as somehow some sort of counterpoint to the crazy things that that he has said. And it's like seriously, right? I, I feel like I've just fallen through the looking glass here. Seriously, mm-hmm. that that's what you've got. That that's your defense. That's the best that you can do. Mm-hmm. And it, it just it just disappoints me. It disappoints me when people are unwilling to be intellectually honest about their own stuff. My feeling mm-hmm. is that if you are a moral person, if you are an intellectually honest person, you got to own your own stuff. I got to own right. my, like, like with the example I gave you about Washington's football team, I got to mm-hmm. own my own stuff. Right. I got to check myself and maybe correct myself when the facts don't line up with me. I got to mm-hmm. be willing to do that before I can talk to anybody else about the stuff they're doing. And what, what we're seeing with, with this party is the exact opposite. We're seeing people who don't want to own or, or own any of their stuff. We're seeing people who make up or making up the rules as they go along, right. who are, you know, just changing, changing the, 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 what they say to fit whatever the, you know, whatever the, the needs of the moment are. They used to talk about situational morality, you know, mm-hmm. They used to complain about situational morality. And what are we seeing now if not situational morality right. on steroids? Mm-hmm. Because I can tell you this, if Barack Obama had refused, had lost in 2012 and refused to, to concede the election to Mitt Romney and held a Black Lives <laughs> Matter rally and said, you got to fight, you got to fight and mm-hmm. sent a bunch of black people to that Capitol and somehow they got in without being shot down. And they and five people got killed and a hundred and some odd police got injured. You would not be having any of these discussions. Barack Obama would not be would not have simply been in peace. He'd have been behind bars by now. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, let's let's stop this. Mm-hmm. You know, let's stop the most. Let, let let let's just stop the baloney. I, one thing I can't I can I can deal with I can deal with differences of opinion, but one thing I really have trouble dealing with uh, for all my life I've had trouble dealing with. If you just bring me something objectively stupid and ask me to take it seriously and pretend that this that this deserves a plate at the, a place at the table, mm-hmm. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. I just something in me rebels. You know, me too. and I just I, I really I, I can deal with a difference of opinion. I can't deal with stupid. If you want to bring mm-hmm. me stupid and ask me to pretend, oh wow, that makes that, that I hadn't thought about that. You're gonna, right. you're gonna, you're gonna lose me every single time, and that, mm-hmm. and that's why they've lost me. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I think you answered. So one of our favorite viewers mm-hmm. asked the question: If you believed forty-five should be impeached, but I think you answered that. But yeah. <laughs> just in case, he, he's been impeached. <laughs> he's already been impeached. Uh, he should be convicted. He probably won't be, and that's a stain on the Senate, and that's going to be a stain on this country forever. Mm-hmm. Forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. We have another question. What can be done to uncouple multiple unrelated issues from con- congressional bills? For example, can they put a checkbox next to each item and any item that gets enough checks automatically go through? Again, that goes back to who you who you send in there and, 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 and what their priorities are and what do they change the rules? Or, yeah, it can happen. I'm sure it can happen. But the question is, do you send in do you identify and send in the people who for whom that is a priority for them as much as it is for you so that they can make the changes? You know, it can be done. It won't be done with anybody who's currently there. I, I, I really doubt that. But can it be done? Yeah. Who, who's, who are the people who, who, who agree with you that this is a priority and this needs to be done? Identify them, identify a bunch of them, send them to Congress or send them to the White House. 
that's the way that that's the way the system works. It's a long game. You know, the, mm-hmm. one of the problems with us as as Americans, one of the problems with people as people is you want, I want change now. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, right. I want this to happen now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's taken us a long time to get into this mess. It is going to take us a long time to dig our way out. Absolutely. And so you, you know, you might we might as well you know get ready for that and start digging. I was going to say, let's buckle up. Yeah, let's buckle up. <laughs> so we have another question. What advice do you have for white allies? Um, I believe that one of the things that is incumbent upon white allies to do, and I, I, and I, I come to this having had the same question as, as male allies, uh, um, about male allies during the uh, Me Too movement. And one mm-hmm. of the things I learned about myself in the, during the Me Too movement, is, is for as much as I like to consider myself in sympathy and empathy with my sisters, uh, sometimes I don't know what I think I know. And one of the most valuable lessons I learned since that October, I think it was uh, three years ago, two, three years ago, when that's st- when those stories began to break and suddenly everywhere you look, there's some guy who's, who's, who's done something horrible and you're shocked and women aren't. One of the things mm-hmm. I've learned is that sometimes I need to shut up and listen. Mm-hmm. You know? I, and I, I've made it a point, you know, I, I tell women all the time, no, you tell me. I shut up and listen to women. I think there's a need, if you're going to be a white ally, to Respect what you don't know. Right. Respect what you don't know, and then learn. Mm-hmm. You know, and the, and there are there are there are books. There are there are many people that you can that that you can talk to. Educate yourself about mm-hmm. some of these issues. Don't project onto African Americans what you think they think, which happens so often. I couldn't begin to tell you. Don't project onto me what you think I think. You know, learn. Listen, mm-hmm. understand that we're not all a monolith. Not all of us think the same thing or have the same experiences, just like regular people. That's know? right. That's <laughs> so, right. So, you know, learn. And then having learned, uh, figure out where you can put your time, talents, and or treasure, you know, to 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 help make a difference. What, what organizations are dealing with the issues uh, regarding African-Americans that are of most, uh, most interest to you? Who's, who's doing what? you know, lend, lend your voice, your time and your talent. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, those to me are, are the two most important things. Have the humility to, 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 to understand that you, the, what you don't know, then figure out a way to, 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 to fix that lack of knowledge. And then, you know, and then I think the rest will suggest itself. Mm-hmm. I've always said, we're looking for comrades. Yeah. And um, if you just sit down and talk, this, yeah. this have a conversation and then really it's about relationship building. Yeah. Um, the thing, so I'm sorry. I was going to say the thing that, that I don't think white people realize is how powerful alliance allyship is or can mm-hmm. be, because if you're white, you have the ability to speak for me and, and be heard in ways and places that I never will. Mm-hmm. That's, that's why, you know, when I speak up on LGBTQ issues, people ask me, well, you know, you must be gay. No, I'm not gay. But I understand right. that, and, and that, that that's anything that, you know, be ashamed of or have to jump to deny. But my point is that I understand that when I speak on these issues, my voice carries a different weight precisely because I'm not LGBTQ. Okay? Mm-hmm. When you as a white person speak on these issues, your voice carries a different weight, not a better weight, not a lesser weight, but a different weight that will reach some people who otherwise will never hear. And mm-hmm. I gotta tell you, every time I see a white person uh, after the uh, ch- the Charlotte's the, the massacre at, at Bethel AME Church, uh, I saw somebody sent me no, I saw it on Twitter, video of a white crowd marching through that town, uh, chanting "Black Lives Matter," mm-hmm. and that you know that for a lot of us as African Americans, that was a very low moment. That was a very sad one, and that that lifted me up like in ways I couldn't begin to tell you. Just the fact, okay, somebody gets it. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody mm-hmm. who does, somebody who doesn't look like me gets it. That mattered to me more than I can tell you. So that being said, do you think because um, it was COVID and and um, you know everybody was in the house and paying attention to the news um, when everyone came out in support of Black Lives Matter? Who I mean, this has been going on what we've experienced, we've experienced for hundreds of years. Right. And now all of a sudden we have a lot of um, white people, especially young white people coming out in support of Black Lives Matter. And um, do you think, um, had this been another time, uh, meaning, you know, if it had not been pre-COVID and had not been in mm-hmm. front of everybody, that we would have had that kind of support. But also, 
Do you think it was genuine? Um, you know, is it is it sustainable? What what do we? And I apologize. You probably hear my dog barking in the background. That's okay. but- <laughs> Um, I do believe it was genuine. I don't know if it's sustainable. We'll see. Time will tell about that. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, people, I've heard that theory before that it was that, you know, COVID having restricted people's movement had a lot to do with 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 the response. But I think that the bigger factor is, is George Floyd and the manner mm-hmm. of his death. Mm-hmm. Because we have, we've seen videos before but the video, like with Ahmaud Arbery, the video is usually right. a little grainy or it's usually from far away or you can't mm-hmm. quite tell or see what's going on. Or sometimes there's, there is no video or it's late, whatever. You know, it's not, we're not talking about high quality video. Mm-hmm. The video of George Floyd, eight minutes and 46 seconds and you are right there on the scene and you can't escape. It is right. one of the most traumatizing things I think I've ever seen on a video. And I think you know, a lot of us have lived in denial of how, you know, how bad policing can be for African American people of color. And I think watching that video uh, was a splash of, 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 of ice water in the face for a lot of those folks who have been in denial. That, mm-hmm. that, that's, that's my, because you're, you're right up on it. And you yes. see not, you see this man, you know, being choked to death. You hear his cries, you hear him calling for his mother, and you see that look on Derek Chauvin's face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, know, you see that look on his face. And if you have mm-hmm. any kind of heart, any kind of, 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 of humanity, you know, and that has to crack your denial. That has to crack through it. If that, if it, if that doesn't crack through it, then you can't be, you can't be reached by anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So here's another question. Um, respect what you don't know or don't believe everything you think and what made you start caring about issues beyond the ones in your own life? How can we be open when overwhelmed? Well, I started seeing the connections, the, the, the nexus between the issues in, in my life. When you, when you, if you are familiar with African-American history and the things that African-Americans have gone through, and then you start looking at say, anti-Semitism in Germany in the 1930s, or you start looking at LGBTQ issues, you start seeing patterns, you start seeing people say the same things. And okay, if they were wrong, when they would when they said this about African Americans, when they did this about African Americans, then they're wrong here as well. You know, mm-hmm. a great example, you know, a lot of people are, 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 were fond or are fond of using the Bible to condemn uh, LGBTQ people. Well, I'm a student of African American history. So I know that the same Bible was once used to condone slavery and Jim mm-hmm. Crow against me. So it's the same, you know, it's a playbook with not a lot of plays. And so mm-hmm. it's the same thing was used, you know, against that, that was used against me as being used against them. And some of the same tactics. When you look at, um, at Germany in the 1930s, uh, and this is a, should be a matter of, of eternal shame for this country, the Nuremberg laws that, that were a, pre- a precursor to the Holocaust, Germany sent people here to study American Jim Crow laws. Mm-hmm. Okay. So mm-hmm. if, you, if you start looking at it, these things are interrelated. Dr. King said all life is interrelated. And I would, I would, would refine that down to all oppression is also interrelated mm-hmm. because a lot of it has the same, the same DNA. So I, I came to understand that if I am concerned, if, if, I'm, if I say that I'm concerned about human rights and human dignity, but all you ever hear me fight for or fight about is when African-Americans are threatened, then that's not principle, that's self-interest, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. But the same, but, for, but if, you're gonna, if you're gonna be beyond self-interest and be a person of principle, then the same thing has to apply. You have to be upset when you see discrimination practice whether it's against people who look like you or whether it's against people who look nothing like you. Right. When you see people being insulted, when you see people denied or denigrated, it, you know, if they, if they look like you or they don't look like you, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you have to be concerned. Otherwise it's, it's just, it's just looking out for your own. And we have, Lord knows we have more than enough of that That's uh, right. in this country and, and mm-hmm. in our history. You know, mm-hmm. I, I surprised some folks back in 2014, I did a story on white poverty. I went to the whitest, poorest place I could find, which is in the uh, foothills uh, of uh, Kentucky, uh, Owsley County, uh, you know, just incredibly poor place. And I did that because I wanted to, you know, we have this habit in news media of 
presenting poverty as an inner city phenomenon, and we usually put some black or brown face on it, but most of the poor in this country, uh, there are more white poor in this country than all other poor mm -hmm. combined. Mm -hmm. And so I want, it's sort of a blind spot, and I wanted to go deal with that, because if you're concerned, if poverty is your issue, if you're concerned about poverty and how the poor are treated, then it's not just people who look like me, it's right. not just people who look like you, it's not just, you know, uh, Hispanic people, uh, Native American people, it's white people. Right. It's mostly white people, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I, I really believe in, 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 in sort of looking at the print. What is the principle that underlies this, as opposed to just being concerned about me and mine? That's why you know I write about women stuff, and I write about LGBTQ stuff, and I write about Jewish stuff, and I write about you know white power because to me it's all the same thing. It's all the same, the same story. It's all about how we choose to mistreat people, based on this fiction that. I'm superior to you because of my mm -hmm. skin color, my sexuality, my gender, or my bank account. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. Well, Mr. Pitts, I could talk to you all night long. I have thoroughly mm -hmm. enjoyed this conversation. It was an honor to be even be asked to interview you. Oh, wow! Um, you stop, stop. sometimes I would be able to. I'll be able to tell you why at another take at another okay. time. But um, this has been an honor, and um, Nick is telling me time is up. <laughs> and um, would love we would love in Prince George's County to have you back for any one of your topics of interest. So yeah. um, Nick, whenever you're ready, um, I hate to end this show tonight, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Nick, you're muted. I owe everyone happy hour. That's our rule. That's <laughs> second, second round today that I owe. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry to have to cut cut the discussion off because this is, has really been a powerful um, yeah. and inclusive conversation, I think, opened up some pathways for people to kind of get right with themselves, self-included in reflection stuff. So I really appreciate it. And thank you, especially um, Mr. Pitts, for your words about being an ally for the LGBTQ plus community. That's something gets left out of a lot of these conversations. And uh, it means a lot when when people uh, go out of their way to champion the LGBT community. So thank you for that. Um, so since you are local and we know you live between two of our branches, we look forward to uh, keeping in touch <laughs> with you and having you back whenever you've got new books out. And just want to remind everyone that uh, Mr. Pitts has several books that you can get through the library, both in print and as eBooks or audio books. Visit our website, pgcmls.info. You can also get the books through our um, app on the App Store, Android, or Apple. Um, and then uh, I, I just want to remind everyone that this is part of an ongoing series with the Human Relations Commission, as we heard before. And we sincerely thank Maryland Humanities for their uh, support. We've got two more events in the series coming up this winter. Stay tuned for the details. We're going to be looking at um, Latin identity and uh, being a Latino, not, not meaning that you're part of a monolith. So kind of the same conversation in a different application. Um, and we saw a lot of uh, media coverage of, for example, how could South Florida vote for Trump? Well, there's a lot of reasons. And if you kind of opened your eyes to stop thinking of all Latinos as one homogenous entity, you would understand why that's possible. So um, that's one. And then we're also going to look at immigration and its role on uh, policy as well as elections. Um, I'd just like to draw your attention to a few more events that we have coming up before we wrap. Um, so thank you for your patience as I get through them very, very quickly. Next Wednesday, we are thrilled to welcome debut author Anna Malaika Tubbs, whose new book, The Three Mothers, examines the life and work and legacy and inspiration of the mothers of James Baldwin, Martin Luther King Jr., and Malcolm X. It's a very important book that has just come out. And um, she'll be interviewed by Jamise Harper, who's another one of our favorite hometown literary types. She is the founder of the Spines and Vines um, Instagram. And on... February 22nd at 7 p.m. Our colleagues are hosting Black Excellence and Achievements Quiz Game, highlighting African-American accomplishments in Maryland and beyond. Should be lots of fun. Make sure you sign up on our website and shout out to Lorraine for uh, making sure that that is available to everyone. And 23rd of February, Michelle returns with Kyla Hannington for the Elephant We Don't See Diversity Dialogue series, where they will be leading a discussion on Tana Heise Coates's uh, World of Me. And then last but not least, Wednesday, February 24th, 7 p.m., our monthly open mic series, hosted this week by Carrie and Gray, Misha Matthews, uh, and the theme is for the culture celebrating Black heritage. Um, so we've got many more things going on beyond that. Check out our website, follow us on social media, at PGCMLS. Thank you to Renee and Kyla and the Human Relations Commission for their collaboration. 
day in and day out every day. We love you. And um, thank you, Michelle, for being a wonderful moderator and colleague. And thank you again, Mr. Pitts, for uh, sharing some time with us. And good night, everyone. We'll see you again soon.